Okay. Good afternoon, folks. My name is Wendy Cromash. I am uh, pleased to welcome you to today's Levy Lecture, sponsored by the Levy Senior Center Foundation. Uh, we are delighted to welcome back for the second time, Dina Robinson, the founder and director of Shorefront, um, Shorefront Legacy, Legacy Center. Okay. And um, we're thrilled that he's here to share with us a uh, presentation about the um, the first eight sites that are going to be um, historically represented and preserved in Evanston. Uh, let me just go through um, one or two announcements and then we will um, allow Dino to have the stage. Um, I wanna remind everyone that we still have a few of these delightful 100% uh, cotton uh, long sleeve t-shirts in large and extra large. They're $15 a piece. Great buy. If you're interested, contact me and I will deliver your order to you personally. I also want to encourage everyone to uh, register for Evanston's free local uh, newspaper, the Evanston Roundtable. Uh, they're having a membership drive this month, and uh, it's important for us as community members to support local journalism. This is an award-winning paper, and um, we welcome your support. You can sign up, evansonroundtable.com slash sign up. So if you live in Evanston, you probably have heard of or know Dino Robinson. Dino has created something pretty much out of thin air. He created and founded a center for um, historic preservation and scholarship and sharing with the community displays of um, black history on the North shore. He has done this as a labor of love. Um, I don't know whether he's ever taken a salary for his position. He does this in addition to his full-time job working at Northwestern University, um, at Northwestern University Press. He's amazingly talented, very dedicated, and this is his baby. So take it away, Dino. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me today. And um, for those who, uh, you know, again, who have not heard of Shorefront, we are an organization that documents the African-American experience on Chicago suburban North Shore area. Uh, the suburbs we uh, include are Evanston, North New Lake Forest, um, with a specific interest and emphasis on Evanston, Glencoe, and Lake Forest because of its long-term presence of the African-American community. And Shorefront's been around for about 25 years now, building an archive and adding legitimacy to a local history that was not well documented in the past. Um, and part of this is what I'm gonna to present today is uh, honoring sites that were important and continue to be important to the African-American community. And there was an effort to do this early on um, in the 1980s, I'm sorry, in the 1990s, and I'll kind of go over that as well with you. Um, so this is honoring a historic community, uh, Evanston, Illinois. Uh, let's see, get this right, here we go. Sorry, kind of advanced way too quickly there. Let me go back one. Uh, let me actually stop the share for a second. I'm gonna start again, uh, cause I kind of went too fast on this. Let me try this again. Play. All right. So, um, Shorefront started uh, this work with the um, recommendation of you know, Alderman, we can't, former Alderman. Up. Oh, we can't. You can't see. see anything. No. Okay. Hang on. All right. Let me see. If, let me try this again. Sorry about that. That's okay. Uh, share screen. Boom. 
share. All right, now I right. think we're at it. Is that right? Okay, yes. great. Thank you. Technical sure. difficulties here. <laughs> That's okay. And and so, folks, I'm assuming that the sound is good for everyone. If you um, are having difficulties, uh, send me a note in the Q and A. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, about two decades ago, there was an attempt to create a heritage uh, 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 conservation district in the Fifth Ward. And this process was started by Alderman Kent um, at Alderman, current Alderman at that time, along with several community members that wanted to take stock of what was important in the Fifth Ward, specifically to the African American community, and recognize uh, the history and its location in Evanston. The work uh, ended up creating an organization uh, with the acronym PITCH, which stood for Preserving Integrity Through Culture and History. And the information, um, informal meeting started in 1995, and a study was commissioned at that time. Uh, throughout its course of designating um, and identifying locations, uh, a report was uh, put together and submitted to the Preservation Commission. Um, and during that time in 1996, the um, Trust for Historic Preservation Conference that was held in Chicago, and part of their conference activity was a tour of the Fifth Ward to help promote the ideas and the concepts of pitch. Um, this was at the very beginning when I started work doing research on shorefronts, uh, developing shorefronts, and I actually was involved in this pitch initiative. Um, and helped with the bus tour. And you see me in this photograph, I'm kind of like standing right there. I can see the arrow, I'm circling myself there. And this is former alderman uh, Joseph Kent, who was uh, the organizer of Pitch. Um, the other Dino, area, uh, the other Dino somebody, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, we're still on the first, you know, the home page of the, um, oh, the really? title page. That is yes. interesting. It did not go anywhere, huh? No. Resume share. How about now? Are you on the second page? No. This is interesting. Did anything advance now? No. All right, let me uh, stop share again and then I'll share again. Uh, Share screen, share. Okay, now now we're on the right. second page. Uh, okay. Just just go to the third page, see if we can do that. Mm -hmm. Does it work? No. Did you see it? No. No, it's not go It's not advancing. Huh? Let me try one other way of doing this. Um, I mean, can you see you... the third screen right now? Can you see it like this? We can see it. There's the, you know, the small um, thumbnails on the left-hand side. Um, mm -hmm. How about? Can you see the slides now? By themselves. Uh, we see the pitch side slide. But you don't see anything else. No. Try go see if it'll advance, please. Yes. Okay. Do you see the idea and yes. then the bullet points? Yes. Yes. Do you see Do you see a newspaper article next to it? Yes. Okay. All right. I think I'm gonna have to do it this way. I think this might work the best way. So, yeah, I see some people raising their hands. Um, just want to make sure that people can see things. Okay. Yeah. People are seeing perfect now. Great. Love this uh, technical stuff. <laughs> Um, as I, I was saying, um, the, the pitch uh, tour, um, this is me standing here in the crowd with the audience here. You see the size of the, uh, uh, the Historic Preservation Conference uh, tour. I think we had over 80 participants that came on the tour. Um, and it was uh, taking place on two tour buses. I, had, I moderated one of the tour buses and Ann Earl moderated the other tour bus. And we kind of went through a specific route in Evanston 
to highlight the history of the black community, as well as point out some landmarks that were in there. Um, once the report was done and submitted to the, uh, uh, the Preservation uh, Commission, City of Evanston's Preservation Commission, um, there was some talk about it for a while, but then the effort kind of stalled. Um, the hard part was, you know, what does a conservation district look like? There wasn't really a definition for that yet. What would that entail? How do we um, identify historic places when most of conservation districts or historic districts or preservation districts are predicated on architecture and or the prominent of an architectural designer? Um, this wasn't the case with the Fifth Ward. The uh, buildings itself wasn't necessarily historically significant to architecture, um, but for its history, it was extremely important. And how do you uh, kind of put a designation on that? What does that program look like? Um, but because of that, the whole program kind of stalled a bit. Even though we kept on moving forward with uh, research, um, we, you know, worked with community members. We um, talked to um, other officials and identified more and more properties. The end result of all the research that was done resulted in a, a huge collection of photographs and forms that identified properties, uh, explain and describe those properties, uh, its architectural structure, its type of art, um, design, um, all throughout the fifth ward. And all that work now resides at Shorefront. That was our, um, all donated to Shorefront. Um, about four years ago, um, Alderman Ruth Simmons, former Alderman Ruth Simmons, um, came to Shorefront and asked, you know, or had the idea of creating a preservation district. And I had that opportunity to kind of educate her on the processes of what Pritch was doing 20 years ago. And uh, she was really excited about that. And we had a meeting with myself, uh, Robin Simmons and Earl and Mary McWilliams to kind of like dust off that report and see what we can do with it. Um, I also set up a meeting with the Evanston Preservation Commission and uh, they immediately got on board. They knew what it was about. They knew what I was there for and they were 100% on board and they formed a subcommittee to help um, identify what the next steps would be. So with that idea, some of this, um, I see some people are raising their hands. I wanna make sure that everybody's okay. Um, some of the ideas that came to fruition kind of um, materialized more when I was asked to um, help protect the former foster school, now Family Focus building. Uh, family Focus was looking at selling the building and the community began to panic about what's gonna to happen to that building. Will it be torn down? Um, so again, Alderman Simmons asked if I can do something to help um, generate some type of landmark status for this building. Um, and with the help of Mary McWilliams and Anne Earl, we put together a report and a presentation to the Preservation Council to help preserve that building and designate as a historic landmark of which uh, we were successful. Um, it did meet with resistance with the landowners, uh, Family Focus, who felt that designating the building would cause it uh, cause harm to where they can't sell the building or put various restrictions on that. But what I was able to argue with is that this is not the attempt to create too many restrictions, but to honor the building for its history, uh, to showcase as many architectural styles that that building had and also the importance of which that building had to the community. Um, and so that became a successful approach. And I kind of use that same approach with designating um, a historic preservation area and reinvigorating that discussion. Um, with that discussion, and I had mentioned earlier before, I did acquire the paperwork that was used to create pitch. And these boxes and these photographs are representation of the boxes and binders of research that was done to look at the uh, Fifth Ward and its historic um, 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 his significance to Evanston. So we knew that no new study needed to be done. 
we also knew that a model needed to be created that can be useful in the city of Evanston, but not detrimental to uh, property owners. Um, how could this uh, program be supported in the future and what would the recognition look like? And that's what we started working on with the Preservation Commission to help identify what the next steps would be. We also identified areas in the Fifth Ward and I highlighted the Fifth Ward area in the solid gray box here. But also I want to identify that there were other smaller communities throughout Evanston, scattered throughout Evanston. And how do we recognize all that together? Um, and so instead of creating multiple historic districts, we figured that, you know, we just look at the entire city of Evanston as the district and see where we can start identifying. Um, and in this list here, I can see where some of the areas that we were focused on uh, to talk about, to research more, and to give more um, credence to that. Moving forward, we did realize that we did not want to do a historic district or a conservation district, but we want to recognize sites that were scattered throughout Evanston and also to help understand, um, have people understand that there are historic sites throughout Evanston. It wasn't just located in one area. It also gave the, um, the, the historic fact that, you know, there was, you know, before 1900, there wasn't a sense like a black community, a locale, but all of Evanston is where everybody lived throughout Evanston. And early history was um, historic sites were scattered throughout all of Evanston. And we wanted to designate that. So we looked again at some key sites that we want to start a program with. Uh, myself, uh, with help with the Fifth Ward residents um, and the Preservation Commission. And we identified what sites we should focus on first, just to jumpstart a program. And we uh, identified eight sites scattered throughout Evanston, immediate downtown area, near the lakefront, South, uh, South Evanston, and within the Fifth Ward itself to kind of show this pattern of here's where the communities were and we need to honor these communities. And each one had each of them their own significant history that ties to present as well as past. Um, we ended up writing a resolution that the Preservation Commission um, approved and voted unanimously to support. That resolution was then passed to city council, which also met with a unanimous uh, support and vote for the passing of 54R20, which established the African-American Heritage Sites Program. And it was adopted June 22nd, 2020. And what's unique about this is that this historic project is guided by community members. So we're setting the, our own rules. We're setting um, aside what is important for the community. And it's governed by the communities that are affected by it. And we thought that was a really good novel approach where the city is not mandating certain things, but the community members are active participants in designating historic sites. And that's where it gets really exciting because we are getting um, a lot of ideas and a lot of recommendations of what sites should be utilized. Um, this made uh, local media, uh, Roundtable, the Evanston Review, Evanston Now, Daily Northwestern. And uh, about a year ago, I was also asked to present this idea to uh, the, uh, the, the architectural tour that was in Chicago. And I did this presentation uh, for that group, uh, um, discussing how we were able to put this program together and what it looks like. We also want to kind of figure out what kind of marker that we can acknowledge these sites. And, you know, we first started with some ideas with like some type of cast iron um, signage that's put on a post. But we realized that putting these on people's properties or on the parkway can pose a lot of um, either reservation, rejection, or other concerns about safety and maintenance and costs. So I sort of looked around for alternative ideas and I always was enamored by, you know, if you look at sidewalks, sometimes uh, the sidewalk manufacturer, whoever laid and poured the sidewalk, they had these little um, metal plates that were implanted in the sidewalks that um, advertising what company laid the sidewalk. 
in further investigation, I saw that some cities were using these uh, markers also for historic settings or for advertising. And I thought it would be a novel idea to do the same concept uh, with a marker that be embedded in the sidewalk uh, in front of the properties that gave um, little resistance. Um, it was controlled by the city there and the city gave us permission to implant these markers in the sidewalk. And it made it easier for um, uh, just adding to it when we need to. So we contracted a local designer, Ben Blount, who uh, came up with a variety of different ideas for our own markers here. And we settled on one near the end that looks like this. And uh, right now the markers are being manufactured. Uh, we're having 50 of them made um, up front and they will be numbered as well. Um, they're cast in bronze. Uh, it's about four inches in diameter. And as we identify the properties, there will be, um, each marker will be implanted within the sidewalk in front of that property. Um, in public places, we intend on having a um, a wayfinder signage so they can do self-guided tours or, or walking tours um, on your own. We'll eventually have a website too that will identify each of these properties. But I'm sure most everybody wants to know like what are the first eight properties that we're focused on. And I saw it on the earlier slide, um, which properties that we're focused on uh, for these first eight to uh, launch this whole program. And the first one is of Edwin B. Jordan Jr., uh, 2032 Darrow Avenue. Uh, this is the house he lived in. This house has been modified uh, since he's lived there. A second story has been placed on it. But uh, when he, uh, Edwin Jordan Jr., when he came to Evanston, um, he studied as a journalist, uh, journalism at Northwestern in graduate school. Uh, but he was um, hired by the Chicago Bee and then later the Chicago Defender. Uh, was a columnist there with the Chicago Defender. He was managing editor of the Chicago Bee. But he also got involved in politics and he ran and won seat as Evanston's first African-American alderman. And he held seat from 1931 through 1947. And he was instrumental in battling against a lot of Jim Crow policies that were taking place in Evanston. Um, and fighting successfully to desegregate things like public parks, public beaches, and other public facilities throughout Evanston, uh, maintaining uh, the look and, and, and lifestyle of uh, families who were living in the Fifth Ward, uh, making sure the streets were clean and make sure all the resources that were available to other communities were also available in the Fifth Ward. And interesting enough that his work too also led the found, um, to the foundation, um, placed the foundation to the work we're currently doing in uh, local reparations that Alderman Rue Simmons has been championing when she was in office. So this is the first site that we'll have. And if you can see the sidewalk here, we intend on putting the marker approximately right here on the sidewalk, right in the middle of like the front way. The second property we want to honor is uh, that of the home of the late Lorraine Morton, who was Evanston's first mayor of Evanston. Uh, when she came to Evanston, she uh, attended graduate school at Northwestern um, and became a pub and, and uh, continued as a public school teacher. She did move away for a short time after she graduated, married her husband, and came back to this property, which was actually owned by her husband at the time. Uh, she continued to live there until close to her death, and uh, we figured that this should be a wonderful addition to honoring. Um, uh, one of the historic markers uh, for her work in Evanston as, all, as, as alderman, teacher, alderman, and mayor. Our third site that we're honoring is the Evanston Sanitarium at 1918 Asbury Avenue. It was established by Dr. Isabella Garnett and Dr. Arthur Butler, husband and wife who uh, started this practice in the house that sits in front of this. And they lived in the house that kind of sits behind uh, that hospital. Uh, the hospital was established in 1914 and remained in operation at that location till about 1924, 1925. And they moved to another location off of uh, Brown, Bridge Street and Simpson, where is now the Over the Rainbow Association. But that was the last side of it. And that was a community hospital at the time. 
So again, we want to place a marker in front of this house as well. This is what it looks like today, if we kind of drive by there today. Another location is in downtown Evanston, the Butler Livery Stable at 914 Davis Street. This was one of his first buildings he had. He had about three sites all together for his uh, uh, buggies and horses and stables. Um, Henry Butler was uh, started as a coachman for the Kirk family and later on with a business partner started and established the Butler Livery Stables. He stayed in operation till about the 1920s. He did ha retire and hand it off to his brothers who then dissolved the business, but he evolved to multiple other things. Henry Butler was one of many uh, siblings that had multiple business throughout Evanston, uh, including grocery store, a roofing business, and another smaller livery business as well. Um, I've always thought this site was interesting because, you know, located in downtown Evanston, right off the tracks, right off of David Street. And again, this is what it looks like now with um, a new condo uh, uh, building there. Uh, the building was kind of set back a little bit more, so it's closer to where like this post is here. And this part, the front part was a vacant lot. Uh, another Butler build, um, business, uh, the grocery store I told you about, uh, uh, was located at 1031 Sherman Avenue. Uh, this was the last structure that was at the location. Now, if you drive by it, it's a vacant lot. But what we're going to identify is that that's where not only the business was, but their home. So this entire lot on the Sanborn map was owned by the Butler family. Uh, homes here and here and coach houses and, and, and storage for here. And they also further down the street had a grocery store. Uh, one of the earliest residents in Evanston, black residents in Evanston was Maria uh, Murray. Uh, she later married George Robinson and they lived at this location at 325 Dempster Street, which is between Judson and Forest Avenue. Um, the houses have been modified since then, but there are actually two houses that are historically significant and there's like a coach house in the back because that's where the last Butler, um, one of the Butler buildings uh, was located in this, um, this area as well. But Maria Murray came to, uh, was brought to Evanston. She was purchased out of slavery and worked for the Allen Bain family uh, and where she worked for the rest of her life uh, here in Evanston. Uh, in the early newspapers, they made a big deal about the marriage, the wedding of Maria and George Robinson, uh, horse and buggy uh, type parade through town and residing at this location for all of their life. So we wanna make sure that this area was recognized that there was a small black community on that block um, with multiple houses, including the Day family. It's where the early organizational structures for both Ebenezer Amy Church and Second Baptist Church started in this location and met at the, the Bible study classes met at these homes before they branched off and uh, built their edifices where they are located now. <laughs> Another site that we're looking at is William Twiggs Print Shop, which was located at 1619 Sherman Avenue, just a little north of Fountain Square. Um, but uh, the Han building is now at its present location. And the approximate location where this building was, uh, this, this um, the job, the printing business was located was approximately right here, the, the northern side of the Han building in downtown Evanston on Sherman Avenue. Uh, William Twiggs first came to Evanston. Uh, he was a barber and then he started print, uh, printing business. Um, by the turn of the century, he relocated his uh, printing uh, business to Emerson Street, but we wanted to recognize the original location of the print shop. And these two individuals sitting in front, standing in front of the building are two of his four children that he had. Um, his wife uh, was a hairdresser and actually started her own product, hair product called Twiggleen. Um, but that was done at a different location where they were living previous before this uh, building was put in place. Uh, when Twiggs uh, started some papers called the Neutral Colored American and the Afro-American Budget. And he also um, did the reporter and directory. Uh, he was a city sealer and he also was one of the organizers of the Emerson Street YMCA. Ebenezer AME Church at its original location at 1813 Benson Avenue. 
It was originally a wooden structure located where this arrow is pointing here on the Sanborn map. So it's on Benson Avenue, just a little bit north of Clark, uh, Clark, Clark Street uh, in downtown Evanston. And this building was uh, built there and put in place in 1882. And it remained there until it caught fire and torn down and uh, the congregation bought a new plot of land uh, on Emerson Street, uh, just a little bit west of where the original location was. Um, but now, if you go drive by there now, there's a condo medium, actually the parking garage for that condo unit. It would approximately be about in this location right here where the church stood. Um, there's an early newspaper article on the side here. It's in the Evanston Index, uh, July 28th, 1883, that kind of described the opening of the church and how it was constructed and uh, some early meetings at that. So it was a really good find to find that article that matched the location and the Sanborn map of where that was located. And just by chance, as we're you know, doing research on this, uh, Sandy Trent was Evanston's first black police officer in 1898. And he lived in this building. Also in this building was a person by the name of Kerry Crawford, who later became known as Madame Sul T. Wan. And it was an actress. She moved away from Evanston, moved to California. And one of her roles that she had was in Birth of a Nation. And one of her pivotal scenes in that was uh, she was portraying a slave fighting against a captor and escaping. She was supposed to have a speaking role and they did have a speaking role in there where she was interacting with more people in the uh, theater, but that in the uh, movie, but that scene was cut. Uh, and this is according to the history of Madame Sul T. Wan. Uh, she performed in over 100, uh, performed as an extra in over 100 movies. And her last movie was in Carmen um, with Harry Belafonte. Uh, and that was, her, I think, one of two speaking roles that she had later in her career. So that is it with the presentation. And um, I'll keep this up, but I would love to uh, entertain any questions. And I hope people are saving the questions and posting them. Um, and I see some people have uh, put some questions in there. And, um, and I do apologize if I couldn't, if I didn't speak loud enough. I'll try and uh, speak up further, uh, more with this presentation moving forward. Um, I do see Kitty Hoffman had one question, what the term a city sealer means. Uh, that is a good question. I didn't kind of look into that yet, um, but it was, um, I, I, I couldn't really formally answer that question. You know, thank you. Um, can you mm -hmm. talk to us uh, about uh, how um, Shorefront acquires its um, repository of all the uh, the collections and and what you're what you're looking to do with the um, the center going forward. Sure. So there's a lot. Yeah, you know, people. Um, what Shorefront looks for there's a variety of things. We always want tangible objects to add to its collection. Um, and actually what I'll do is let me stop sharing for a second and we'll go to a different screen. Um, kind of like quick little video. Uh, this is not working. Can people see the screen here? Yes. All right, let me see if I can play that just so it can go through the video. Um, so Shorefront right now is located at the lower level of Sherman United Methodist Church. And we have over 450 linear feet of archival material. That means organizations and families are donating materials to Shorefront for preservation. Um, sometimes I jokingly call it organized hoarding. Um, what we do with the collections they come in is that we organize them, place them in archival boxes and folders, and we create a report so that you can, um, people could download the report and see what's in all those boxes. Uh, so people can come and do research and ask for very specific items. So one of our largest collections that we have is of Ebenezer Amy Church, uh, a couple of um, NAACP, NAACP 
files. Um, Melvin Smith, who ran a newspaper called the Edmonds News and the CCC. Um, we have um, Edwin Jordan Jr.'s files um, and many and dozens of other families that have donated uh, over the 20, course of 25 years uh, to our archives. We have volunteer processors, mostly coming from Dominican University and at Northwestern University. We're also a member of the Black Metropolis Research Consortium, which is a, a, a committee of multiple community-based and organizational institutions, historic institutions, that specialize in documenting and archiving. So what we're always looking for are more, more donations of not only materials, but also financing because uh, processing is not necessarily cheap. Uh, our cargo boxes for those little, those tan letter boxes that you saw there, they run about $10 each. Um, acid free file folders, you know, packs of 100, they cost about $60 for a pack of 100. So, and then the processing time, a person has to come in and start combing through the collection. Um, on a large collection, they could spend, you know, easily 20 to 30 hours on that collection alone just to organize it, process it, folder it, and create the report. Um, we do get, we are grant, uh, submit, um, supported by grants. Um, and our largest one that we received to date right now is from the Mellon Foundation. And we won this large grant due to the work we're doing with our historic site president, um, um, program that I just presented on, as well as um, the reparations work that we've been assisting the city of Evanston with. That's great. Is the collection digitized? That is always an ongoing process. So every repository across the nation, including the Smithsonian, is in a constant state of trying to figure out what to digitize next, how to digitize it. So it's not as simple as like, here's a photograph, let's scan it, but how do you make that findable and searchable? What's the metadata attached to that? How do we store that? How do we make redundant storage? So we have to be very, um, you know, pragmatic about what we choose to digitize. And what we're focused on right now is our oral history collection. So we have about 37 of those digitized right now. And they're on our website with, um, with uh, transcripts and uh, metadata attached to it as well to make it more searchable and usable. And can you elaborate more on the oral history project? Are, are you proactively seeking out uh, people within Evanston who, you know, to interview? Yes, uh, Shorefront started because of doing oral histories. We want to know more about local history. So we started doing oral history and that's always been a, an ongoing project. Um, Recently, we um, are part of a, our partnership with the Center for Civic Engagement at Northwestern University, where we have a graduate assistant that will be working with us for the next year to uh, spearhead additional a big push in doing more oral histories. So just last Friday, we trained 12 students to do oral histories, and they're going to start going around with a list that we've uh, uh, accumulated to uh, reinvigorate um, more doing moral histories. So this is phase one. I think uh, next semester we'll have another set of students that will do more um, uh, oral histories. We hope to gather about 30 new um, interviews during this course and of the year. Is it just oral or are you also filming? Some, uh, it's up to the students. So some are filming, others are just doing audio. Um, I do have a personal bias. I like doing audio over video. Uh, video, you know, I, I, we're really concerned about people's uh, taking up people's time. So setting up video takes a while to do. Um, and sometimes it can be distracting. Whereas oral and just putting up an audio uh, tape together, um, you, you kind of lose, you kind of lose focus on that. And, um, and people are more engaged with the conversation than they are paying attention to a camera. Okay. Um, if People in the audience uh, are interested in making a donation. Should they just contact you directly or contact Shorefront? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, you can contact us through email. Uh, Shorefront at me.com is our email. We have a website, shorefrontlegacy.org. Um, if you want to donate, uh, there's a donate button on our website. We can um, go straight to our PayPal and our account for Shorefront. Um, we are building an endowment uh, for a financial endowment. 
Um, the endowment is held at the Edmondson Community Foundation. And right now I can kind of publicly say we have about $60,000 in there right now. My goal, Shorefront's goal is to raise $2 million in that. So we have, uh, we can use the proceeds to hire a full-time executive director. Um, for those who don't know, um, Shorefront is my avocation. I work at Northwest University. That's my paid job. Shorefront, um, the board has awarded me an honorarium, monthly honorarium, which is extremely small uh, to cover my travel expenses, taking care of paperwork and going to meetings, um, pay for gas, for example. Um, but I've been doing this for 25 years and uh, this is my gift back to the community because I figured that this collection uh, needs to precede me and my interests. Uh, this archive belongs to the community and it's always meant to stay with the community as well. It's truly a labor of love. It's, it's amazingly impressive, I think, that you've created this out of nothing. Um, so, so there's uh, right, a lot of me, questions in the Q and A. Yeah, yeah, I'm 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 just about to get to those. Okay, um, okay. Bonnie asks. I understand there was a black YMCA. Where was it? Yes, there was a black YMCA. It was an operation from 1914 through 1969, and it was located on Emerson Street, um, about the 1000 block of Emerson Street, uh, approximately across the street where the current Ebenezer Amy Church is now. Right now, there's a condominium there called C2. Um, but that is that, and that structure is on our list for historic sites to honor um, in the next wave of of, of uh, markers. Um, but we also we don't want to, we don't want to proceed too fast with it because we want the community to participate in choosing and selecting what should be honored next. So we don't want to be the gatekeeper of this. We want the community members to be engaged in this and make that process happen. <laughs> Okay. Um, does anyone live in the historic homes? Uh, yeah, some of these places, yeah, like the uh, um, Jordan's home, there's a family that lives in there now um, that is well aware of this historic market project and they're excited about it. Um, also the uh, Lorraine Morton home, uh, former chief, uh, Evanston police chief um, Cook uh, lives in that home currently. Um, and the home where Maria Murray lives, yes. Um, basically all the, all the homes that are there are occupied by family members, uh, from community members. Right. Maureen would like to know, is the Han building named for George Han? That I don't know. That's a good question. Um, something to look into. Uh, I do know it's owned by the Robinson family, uh, the Robinson Bus Company. Um, so Robinson Enterprises owns the building right now. Okay. Uh, Junko would like to know, was the Evanston Sanitarium, uh, was that considered the Black uh, Hospital for Black people? Yes, it was. Yes. Um, and uh, when it opened in 1914, it opened up to service the Black community because uh, both Evanston and St. Francis uh, barred or severely limited uh, patients, uh, black patients, uh, enter those doors or have practicing doctors. So the Emerson Sanitarium uh, became the hospital that serviced the black community, um, and also uh, Isabel Garnett offered training of nurses at that location as well. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about the uh, the husband and wife uh, pair of doctors who ran the sanitarium? Sure. So Isabel Garnett Butler, um, her brother, it was Daniel, Gar um, Daniel Garnett, who was Evanston's first black dentist. And his practice was on Benson Avenue, uh, approximately across from where the Davis Street L stop is today. Um, when his sister Isabella graduated from medical school, uh, I think it was called like the medical, Illinois Medical School, it was located in Chicago. Um, she had her private practice with her brother in the same building with her brother. Um, Arthur um, Butler uh, was a graduate of Northwest University. Uh, both Arthur and his beloved married and together they raised um, funds to establish the uh, Edmondson Sanitarium on Asbury Avenue and they opened their doors in 1914. Uh, Dr. Arthur Butler uh, unexpectedly passed away in 1925 and the hospital uh, was renamed from the Emerson Sanitarium to Butler Memorial Hospital 
after Arthur Butler. And then shortly after that, they moved location to a house that was occupied by Dr. Rudolph Penn, another African-American um, doctor who donated his house to the hospital movement. And so that became the second site on Brown Avenue. And then as time went on, there was a fundraising process to build community hospital adjacent to um, the Penn House, uh, Rudolph Penn's home, the, the new community hospital uh, to build the newer structure that still stands today. Okay. Um, Pierre asks, was there a Blacks only hospital on the west side? Yeah, that was it. That's community hospital. Uh, it was called Butler Memorial. Most people refer to it as the Penn House because uh, it was do donated by Dr. Rudolph Penn. But it was located on um, Bri Brown Bridge and Simpson Street, kind of like that intersection now. And behind the, was, it's now called Over Rainbow Association. And the park behind it is now named after Dr. Isabella Dar Garnett Butler. Okay. Um, Bob asks or comments, I understand Evanston High School District did not have a swimming pool prior to World War II to prevent uh, black children from swimming with white children. Is there any truth to that? Yeah, so in 1930, the new structure, uh, the new high school structure um, opened its doors. The original plan did call for a swimming pool, um, but they postponed that because they realized that if they did open up a swimming pool, it would have to be integrated. So they did not have a swimming pool at first. And so uh, white students uh, took swimming classes at the Central YMCA, which is now the McGall YMCA, and black students went to the Emerson Street Branch YMCA. I think it was up until about the 1940s when they did actually put in a pool. There was still a spillover where blacks still had to go to the Emerson Street Lions here for swimming classes up until about the 1960s when they opened the doors to uh, blacks. And you also see that um, if you look at the Emerson Township High School yearbooks, prior to 1960, any group photographs in there and activities, you don't really see any black students involved in that because black students were pretty much um, barred from participating in these groups, uh, these after uh, curriculum activities, uh, debate teams. And, and if they were a black student, they couldn't really participate elsewhere in other school competitions. Um, I remember one person telling me that she was part of the Esquitarian Club at Evanston Township High School, but she could only ride horses at Evanston Township because in other competitions, other schools would not allow a black person to participate in that. So yes, there is truth to that Evanston Township at one point had a swimming pool that did bar blacks from swimming in there. But it was roughly around like beginning of 19, late 1950s, early 1960s where um, black students were then able to utilize the pool at Evanston Township. Okay. Um, Felicia would like to ask, can you describe physical items donated so far um, from the family of the deceased first black fire chief? Sure. Um, so before Sam Hicks passed away, he and his wife came in, he donated his fire jacket, his rain, the, that big heavy fire jacket, uh, boots. Um, that's what we have right now. His we helmet? are hoping to still receive, uh, we're still hoping to receive this helmet and um, some other artifacts. I think his badge and a few other items as well. But um, there's always a time and place for that. We hope the family, you know, sometimes family wants to hold on to things a bit longer, understandable, but we do hope to grab those things. Same thing with um, uh, Police Chief um, Bill Logan. However, the family is, you know, that stuff is gonna be passed on to family members. So the family members are heavily involved in history. So they wanna hold on to his, um, his badges and his uniform and other items. But there may come a time where they may want to donate that. So what we do is we keep engaging with families that have items that are tangible items that are important to uh, telling the history and illustrating the history of uh, Black lives here in Evanston. But we do get a lot of stuff. Um, um, you know, photo albums, scrapbooks. Uh, we have a scrapbook from a resident who attended Fisk University in the 1930s. And she kept a scrapbook while she attended Fisk there. And she was a socialite. So there are like dozens of uh, letters and invitations uh, for being invited to join clubs, go to dances. And, and she even has a, a letter in there from the Dean 
who had to ground her for violating curfew. So she was grounded for a weekend. And it was, you know, it kind of explained why she was being grounded for, you know, for curfew. But just seeing that slice of life and seeing what was happening at the time period with photographs, letters, invitations, and dance cards, signed dance cards, um, that's a slice of life that can't be, you know, replicated any other way than a scrapbook. Um, we have um, another photo album from a family that was involved in the National Seamstress Union. She was president of the Seamstress Union. So we have photographs of her work in that. Her husband was a Pullman porter. So we have some items from Pullman cars like towels and, and time cards and, 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 and train schedules. But what was really interesting in that collection is that they had a photo album. And as I, and I grabbed these things, um, the, the family that donated it, they had to go through a liquidation before the house was sold. And so I had literally two hours to go through the basement and just grab some things. And one of the things I got was a photo album. And as I was leafing through, um, leafing through it, as we we're processing it, um, I started seeing these photographs like, this person looks familiar. Oh, this is actress Vanessa Williams, the former first Black Miss America. Turns out that their ne the family that donated, um, I got the, art, um, the photo album from, their nephew was um, Vanessa Williams' first husband. And so we're able to see these photographs of this family sitting in Vanessa Williams' home in California before the, before the wedding. And so that was really cool to find to see that and that slice of history and how it connects to a greater national history. Great. Those are just some of the items that we have. <laughs> okay. Uh, is the formerly Hill Hospital in this historic community collection? Yes, it is. Um, it's, um, so a lot of people refer to, um, depending on when you were born, there's a new generation now that refers to um, Elizabeth Hill as her doctor, and she was uh, the director of the community hospital. But she, uh, before her, was Isabella Garnett Butler, who was the director of community hospital. And it was a transition when Hill was coming out of her graduate studies and was training under Isabella Garnett before she took over. So yes, it is part of the collection. We do have items in there, uh, some uh, correspondences, letterheads, uh, brochures, books, and a photo album with, um, I think one part when community hospital was renovating, they took some, uh, stage shots of all the new equipment and rooms that were put together. So we have that collection. We have those photographs in our collection. Okay, great. Um, how soon will the markers be positioned? Well, we were hoping to have them in place already, but um, because of what's happening with uh, the economy, the trading embargoes and resources and materials, it's taking longer to fabricate the uh, markers that you saw in the previous, uh, in during the slide presentation. Um, but we're having 50 of them done. We're expecting them sometime this month. Um, that's the last I heard about that. And But we plan on placing those markers um, probably in the spring after the winter. Okay. And will there be a brochure or a map or a downloadable audio tour available? There will be a map that we're working on right now. We're looking also at a wayfinding map that will be displayed in public parks, as well as a website. And yes, a what brochure is, as well. What is a wayfinding map? So there is a kiosk, a uh, freestanding kiosk that will sit in a public public space that has a map of locations and numbered locations where all the historic markers are located. Okay. Uh, so people do their own self-guided tour. All the markers will be numbered. So you can go to- Like with a QR code? And, with a, uh, we, yeah, we hope to have a QR code that will link to the website so you can see where all the sites are. Okay. Um, Valerie would like to know, will archival photos of these and other sites uh, be available online, I guess, for school age residents? Yes. So they'll be part of the website once we, the website's going to be kind of interactive. It's, um, uh, we have a prototype of it in works right now where you click on it on, on a location with the numbers and the photograph will pop up as well as a descriptor of the property and some historic content to it. Okay, um, Val, or Laurie would like to know, are you planning a museum type exhibition of the donated items? And do you work in conjunction with Evanston History Center? 
So yes, uh, because where we're located, we're looking at uh, acquiring a, a freestanding exhibit case that we're gonna put in some public places and we'll have rotating exhibits out of that. So yes, one of those exhibits will be uh, some historic sites and other items that we have in our collection. We have about three of them queued up right now that we want to exhibit. Um, I kind of want to keep that under wraps until we're ready to uh, launch that, but we're really excited about what we're, what's coming in 2022. Okay. And yes, we have, we don't, we, we do, we do partner with the Evanston History Center. Uh, we collaborate on a lot of ideas and discussion points. Um, we you know the, the whole function of archives is also to share where resources are. So what we have in our collection, we make reference to what's at the Evanston History Center and vice versa. So the Evanston History Center may have some things about community hospital, for example, they would also reference Shorefront that also has items um, of community hospital. And that's the role of what archives do is to show where all the resources are located. And I, with that, are there, um, do you ever get possessive, I guess, of the, of the material that, are there, are there some things that you think maybe that are in other uh, museums that, you know, should be with you or, is it not like that? Yeah, I, it, it is like that and it's not like that. Um, our first goal for any archivist is to make sure that it is preserved um, in a, in a, in a um, repository. That's the first goal. Um, we try and act as neutral as possible. As much as I may want something, I always recommend people to investigate where they feel their stuff should go. I want the owners, the donors of the archives to feel very comfortable with what they, where they're sending it to. And uh, it's up to the archives to make their case as to why they are the right place for that. And we've done that before. And um, some of the collections we had, we were in competition with other archives as well. Um, but fortunately with us, what we have in our upper hand is that we have a very distinct engagement and, and, and reference to what these items mean. And to give an example, sometimes I've gone to other historical organizations where, for example, they had a picture of some women, a historic picture of some women at a park. And the descriptor on that photograph was black women eating watermelon at a park. And what they didn't realize is that I knew what was in that photograph is that no, that's the founder of the Iroquois League. And this is what the Iroquois League did. And this is one of their fundraising events. So we have the contextual um, context behind things that we can identify much easier. Instead of generalizing the history, we're able to add specifics to it and sometimes correct what was done wrong. So that's the important of what we do as Shorefront is creating that narrative that the community has done and also putting the correct context and the importance to such findings. And sometimes the correct stereotypes as well. Uh, Lake Forest for a while had a walking tour in their cemetery. And, every, and, and the cemetery is um, integrated. So there are black, um, historic um, people of color that are buried at the Lake Forest Cemetery. But when they do these walking tours and these reenactments, every time they came to a black character, um, they always spoke in a slave dialect. And I was there and I said, why are you speaking that way? How do you know they spoke that way? I mean, this family, for example, worked for the president of Lake Forest College. They also had their own businesses. How do you know this is the dialect they spoke? And so they actually had to change their dialogue to understand that there could be a salt and draw, that's one thing, but to speak in some type of broken English is not the appropriate thing to do or to assume that. Right. Uh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, it, these are all uh, heavy concepts. Um, oh, and thank you, Terry. I like, hi, Terry. <laughs> um, does Shorefront have uh, hours that the public can drop in and uh, do research or is it by appointment only? Uh, so we have, we have um, for researchers, there's appointment, for graduate students, there's appointments, uh, on, um, appointments that can be made on Thursdays and Fridays. But we are open to the public on Saturdays from, two to, um, from 10 to two. And um, 
more and more people are starting to get, especially now with um, this time, you know, in COVID, um, more and more people are actually looking through their their own family archives and bringing things in. Um, we had a, a person who just recently moved back from um, from New York to, back to Evanston, where she was born and raised, and she's doing um, research on her grandfather. And I was able to show, show her some things that she didn't know existed. I found her um, her grandfather's name listed in the early Evanston directories. So we're able to listen to all the addresses where he lived. And this is helping her with her research, but in turn, she wants to donate items of her grandfather's, including his her grandfather's wallet that still has her driver, his driver's license in it and some other um, um, membership cards in there. She wants to donate that to the archives. Great. Um... What is the Sanborn map? So Sanborn maps, uh, these are municipal maps that are located, um, that, that map out the footprint of a city. If you look at it, it's a pretty over, it's an oversized book. And usually the like city, uh, city officials will hold on to it. And every time there's a new building that's built, they would actually make a new drawing on that map that showcases the location and color coding it so they know what the building is made from, either it's brick or wood, um, sometimes it's square footage, and it changes over time. So sometimes you see like cutouts and new um, inserts made on the map. So you see an overall map that's zoned out and then each page has a close up of, um, of, of several blocks you can see what's on there. So, um, and they stopped doing this probably in the 1930s, 1940s, but they're very useful. Some people refer to it as fire maps. So that you see, you know, uh, it's a layout of uh, in detail, homes and buildings and what they're made of. Okay. Uh, Sarah asks, have people seeking grants from the Evanston Reparation Fund looked for documentation through Shorefront to help with their applications? Yes. And on top of that, the application process that the city released uh, was um, guided by uh, uh, shorefront by myself who um, recommended the types of documents that are searchable and usable and not to make it complicated. So some of the things we have, for example, is that we have a, a near complete collection of Emerson Township yearbooks dating back to 1918 through I think uh, 20, 2020. I think it's the latest one we have. When but, was um, the school established? The school was established uh, before 1900. Oh, in fact, wow. there were actually in fact there, there were actually two high schools in Evanston at one point. Uh, one was called um, Evanston Township High School, and the other one was called Evanston High School. The Evanston High School only lasted for about 12 years before it shut down and merged into Evanston Township High School, and both were located in downtown Evanston area. Um, and then in 19, um, then um, Boatwood School was built on Dempster and Sherman. And then they still need to grow its location and they move the, um, um, they, they build new structure where apparently Evanston Township is today, but not without any debate because for a lot of people in the community did not want the high school built out that way because they figured it was too rural and too out of the way, but not realizing how fast Evanston was growing in 1930. I think somebody asked me too, if I, if I was related to uh, Maria Robinson, no, nope, I'm a different Robinson altogether. Maria and George Robinson did not have kids. Okay. Uh, do you know, I am very curious, your background, your professional backgrounds in graphic arts, and yet mm -hmm. you know so much about, uh, you know, research, preservation, um, museum uh, policies. Uh, how did you... How did you acquire all this uh, experience and knowledge? Okay, so academically, uh, my minor was African-American studies. Um, I did consider a career in teaching history, um, but I love graphic design, so that took off first. And um, I was an art director in advertising. So my interest in archiving um, kind of started with my grandmother. Um, I was 13 years old. Um, and visiting my grandmother in South Carolina. 
And um, I kind of joke about this. It's um, when I was down there, it was like 102 degrees outside, 104 degrees inside, and they didn't believe in air conditioning. So I had a hot fan blowing on me. And at age 13 with no TV in the house, um, I was born, I started looking through these photo albums that my grandmother put together. And I started flipping through these photo albums. And then as a 13 year old mindset was, I saw a whole bunch of old black and white films of dead people, no context whatsoever. And my grandmother knew what I was doing. So she sat down next to me and uh, started going through each of the pages and explained to me who these family members were and what they did in their lives. And that got me hooked to doing, you know, researching history and researching family history. So researching my own family history kind of led to more interest in community history. And um, other people who influenced me in that, you know, in, involved uh, the editor of the Edmondson Clarion newspaper that was published in the 1990s, uh, my history professor at Loyola University, uh, my history teachers at Edmondson Township High School, um, uh, Mr. Griesbach and, and Mr. B Mr. Eddie Brusetti, who um, I saw recently and thanked him for his history classes that he taught me and kept me engaged in history. But I also got involved at the Edmondson History Center. I was a board member there and then I became board president and also served on their collections committee. So I learned by participating in and engaging in other historical organizations that were doing what I was aspiring to do. That's great. Um, are you, were you born in Evanston? Are you a native Evanstonian? I am not a native Evanstonian. I am considered a newcomer. So I came here, I entered eighth grade. And which is interesting too, when I started doing Shorefront, the questions I would get, the first two questions I would get were, why are you doing this? Who are you, who are you to do this? And you don't know anything about our history. And I always re kind of like align myself with um, the, these residents who I honor and they're my teachers. Every day I always consider them my teachers. Um, that we have collectively, we have a larger history and we have a tendency to tell our history from our point of view in our own timeline. And so that timeline tends to travel with that person. So what Shorefront attempts to do is build that timeline back to the beginning again and kind of illustrate the entire collective histories and how they interconnect with each other and families that live here today. So that it's a more unified discussion about a collective history um, and also re-educates people that there's a longer history before your time. So let's say when somebody might say, well, the first person that moved over here was this person. And I'll say, well, what about these families that lived there previous to them? And so kind of illustrating that aligns longtime residents as to the importance of knowing the full history and also building an archive where there's an attempt to preserve something, this historic documentation to prove that case. It's very meaningful. And especially because the Levy Senior Center Foundation is designed uh, to support uh, and enhance the lives of seniors in Evanston, it, it shows a great respect for the memories and the um, collections of older people. Yes. Well, um, folks, this presentation will be uploaded to YouTube uh, on the Evanston, uh, on the Levy Senior Center Foundation YouTube channel later this evening. Uh, Dino, thank you so much. This was really interesting. And uh, there are a lot of us who knew nothing about this and it was very educational. So very well, inspiring. Thank you all for having me. And again, if you have any additional questions, feel free to email me at shortfront at me.com. Uh, if you know families that need to be preserved and you know advocate for Shorefront, ask them to donate archival material to Shorefront, it could be photographs, invitations, ad books, um, paperwork, even receipts from stores. That's all historic information that's needed. Okay. And of course, Great. money. <laughs> sure. And, and for if you have interview candidates, people that should be. Absolutely. Are any of your personal um, effects inside of the collection, like your grandmother's uh, scrapbooks? Um, I had uh, just um, on, on request of our board, I put together an archive of myself, which was like the hardest archive to deal with. 
Um, but I have that, um, I'm still building on it and I'm still adding things to it, but it should be in a collection time in 2022. Excellent. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. People, next week, um, we are having another lecture because uh, the week after that is Thanksgiving and we're anticipating people will be busy or traveling or whatever. Uh, we are going to have a wonderful presentation of Spoon River Anthologies. It's a great, um, it's basically a show, a show between um, two people, um, husband and wife. Um, you have seen um, Patty before. Uh, she has, uh, she did a historical impersonation of Emily, um, I'm having a senior moment. I can't remember Emily's last name, but um, you've seen you've seen Patty before. She is going to be doing Shorefront, uh, or excuse me, not Shorefront. She's going to be uh, presenting Spoon River anthologies with her husband. It's going to be marvelous. Uh, so if you're looking for just pure entertainment and um, really just a terrific presentation next week, uh, Tuesday, one o'clock. Dino, thank you so much. It was really great to have you again and uh, best of luck. Thanks everyone. Thank you.